Well, my name's Cass, as Janet said, and uh, this morning we are continuing our series on I Choose. I Choose. Pastor Bill last week kicked it off, um, talking about purpose. And this morning we're talking about a word that, do you know, for some of us makes us recoil a little bit. I had my uh, moment this week where I thought, why am I preaching on this? Discipline. I'm not disciplined. You know how you have that moment where you think about all the things that you're not? I'm not disciplined in this and in that and in this. And, and, I'm, and I started to think about, you know, maybe it should be someone like my husband who gets up every morning at six o'clock and goes riding up to Seaford and then every other morning goes running and he's just so disciplined. And so I went to Tim and I said, are you sure you want me to share? And he's like, yes, <laughs> you're the right person to share this morning. I went, okay, Lord, you've got to give me something good. <laughs> but I, I wonder if you're like that too, if you recoil a little bit at the word discipline. Is there some of you like that? Come on, let's be honest. Put your hands up. Thank you. Some of you actually go, I like being disciplined. I like order. I like structure. I like crossing my T's and dotting my I's. I like things to be ordered and neat and not messy. Who's like that? Yeah, about half and half. Good. Well, <laughs> some of us do recall that the word di- discipline because we, we, we're acutely aware of all the things that we're not. In fact, we talk to ourselves about it all the time. <laughs> Often we try to define and measure ourselves and others by how disciplined we are in certain areas and by how we should be choosing and behaving, but it's so obvious that we're not. And so you might be sitting here saying, well, I'm not a disciplined person. But that can very easily lead into some distorted thinking like, I can't get anything right or I'm just bad. And that's coming from a place of shame, actually. Shame. There's some of us, though, who wear discipline like a badge of honour. I, I really like to be disciplined can actually turn into, I'm better than most. And at least I'm more disciplined than Cass. Or whoever you want to insert in there. <laughs> But right from the outset this morning, I want to say that discipline is not something to dread. It's not something to dread. Isn't that good? Someone once said, if only, those must be the two saddest words in the world. If only. Regret is much harder to live with than the inconvenience of discipline. To get to the end of your life and realise that you have wasted something of true worth is incredibly sad. And so Pastor Bill did share last week about focusing on purpose over popularity. To avoid regret, we need to choose to live for a purpose that's greater than ourselves, for an eternal purpose. But we also need to choose discipline, being willing to count the cost now because of what will be ours later. And this affects our practical everyday choices, how we spend our money, what we do with our time, how we use our gifts and our resources that we've been given, what we prioritise in our relationships, what we view online, what we listen to or focus our thoughts around. Discipline is around our choices and it is really practical. For some of us, the word discipline does remind us of times when we experienced what we thought at the time was Discipline, but actually was out of control anger and punishment. And so instead of being given the opportunity to think about your choices, make the right ones and at times experience healthy boundaries and consequences for your wrong actions, some of you are told, you can't get anything right. And you believed it. Maybe you still think like that. We all have scripts in our head. Sometimes they're distorted about how we see God and how we see ourselves. But, you know, with God's help, those scripts can be rewritten. God's design for discipline is not something to dread. And so when I talk about this word this morning, God wants us to to get a, a picture of what he means when he says discipline. 
not coming to it with our assumptions, I guess. God's design for discipline is not something to dread, nor is it something to wear as a badge of honour in a smug, prideful way, demonstrating how much better you are than someone else. It's actually about learning and practising skills of faith, responding to God's kindness through trust and obedience, being trained to run the unique life race that he's called you to run, And sticking at it, even through tough times, to receive an eternal prize. Discipline is not something to dread. The second thing I want to say this morning is that discipline and discipleship are a package deal. You can't separate. Well, you sort of can. You can do discipline as a a self-will thing, a willpower thing. But you can't really sustain it. And it's often outward rules It doesn't necessarily change the inner motivation of your heart. Discipline and discipleship are a package deal. Do you know the word disciple, the Greek word for it, means pupil of, apprentice to a master craftsman. Do you ever wonder what it would have been like to be an apprentice to Jesus the carpenter? Rock up at the back of his house, maybe had a room or a shed, or whatever they have in those days, and he's got his wood there, and he's got his tools. And you rock up, and you're watching him work, and use the tools, and you think, oh, well, that looks way too hard. He's like, it's all right. Can you start with this over here? And as he's working, you're asking him questions, and he's amazing you with his answers. How cool would that be? That would be really cool. Well, Jesus, the carpenter who walked this earth, is not physically here now, but he's here by his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit wants to lead us to actually help us to understand that we are apprentices of the master craftsman, the one who made us. That he lived the perfect life. And if we want to see what life looks like, that's the most healthy, whole life successful life we look at Jesus we look at how he treated people we look at how he spoke about people we look at what he did what his motivations was what he prayed how he spent his time and we see a life that we want to learn from and be like and the first disciples they were a pretty motley bunch like I don't know if you've know much about the Gospels and have read much about the early disciples, but they were like rough, raw fishermen, tax collectors, guys who were very zealous for stuff, but, you know, weren't very disciplined in their own attitudes and stuff. And so I think there's a lot of hope for us because when I look at them, I think, man, (laughs) if you can use them, then you can can use me, Jesus, because I've got some of the same issues that they had. (laughs) But in the New Testament, dis- discipline is actually about training for righteousness. Training for righteousness. Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, wants to teach us to become more like him. To be more effective witnesses to the gospel, to lead lives that delight the heart of God and to win the crown that awaits the faithful servants who follow Jesus. And when he calls us home, We don't know when that's going to be. When he calls us home and we see him face to face, do you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Do you want to? I do. And so God's design for discipline is to train us and prepare us for this eternal moment so that when we're standing before him, there won't be deep regret. What did I do with what you entrusted to me, Jesus? Um, I wish I focused more on the things that really matter. <laughs> now I see it so clearly. I wish, I wish I cooperated with you more. I know you tried to teach me, but I was too busy, distracted, unwilling. 
Those called to be a disciple of Jesus are also called to a lifetime of learning, a lifetime of learning, a lifetime of learning from and being an apprentice to the master. And some of you need to hear this this morning. You haven't graduated yet. Just saying. We haven't graduated yet. You've been following Jesus a long time, but you're still an apprentice to the master. I remember going down to my step granddad's house. Um, my nan remarried after her first husband passed away and never got to meet my grandfather, but went down to stay at their house and I came out in the morning to get a cup of water or something and I saw him sitting at a table, this elderly man just reading his Bible. I thought, what is he doing? This was before I was a Christian. <laughs> why is he read why why would he just make time to read the Bible? Like it really impacted me, the fact that he was setting aside a time, no one else was around just to actually read the Bible. And I think there is an example of a man, a lifelong learner who is still an apprentice of Jesus, still wants to sit and listen for his voice, still wants to come under the authority of his word, still wants to be shaped by him. And it really impacted me. And actually that night, there was a whole other lot of circumstances that led up to that. But at that night, I remember not knowing exactly what to pray, but I prayed, prayed, God, if you're real, show me. Because I don't want, if you're real, I don't want it to be a fad. I want, it, I want to be like Keith, who actually lives it in his everyday life. You haven't graduated yet. Neither have I. Eugene Peterson, the guy who wrote the Message Bible, or paraphrased the Message Bible, wrote an amazing book which has a great title which he took from another quote from somewhere else. But it's, it's actually a title that's really a description of discipleship. It's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And a quote from it, he says, Religion in our day has been captured by the tourist mindset. What does a tourist do? Some of you like going travelling, seeing the world, going on tours, getting your happy snaps, posting them on Facebook for us all to see and going, oh, wish I could go too. <laughs> um, a tourist is into sightseeing and they're in it for what you can get out of it. And so often in, in, in church life, there's some, sometimes people are searching for the next spiritual experience and the next big thing and the next fad and the next thing that comes in they're after entertainment there's no intimacy no deepening relationship no long-term investment you just oh yeah that's nice thanks Jesus snap see you next Sunday and there's no way that your faith plays out in a significant way in your life during the week maybe that's you and this morning's word for you is to say are you my disciple Or are you just a tourist coming along when there's something that you need and checking me out and going away to the next time? He goes on to say in another quote, Eugene Peterson, two biblical descriptions for people of faith in the Bible. One is disciple, one is pilgrim. A disciple means we just spend our lives being apprenticed to our master. We are in a growing learning relationship always. And we seek not to acquire information about God, but skills in faith, how to grow in our faith capacity. Pilgrim tells us that we are people who spend our lives going somewhere, actually going to God through thick and thin. We're going somewhere, we're going to God. And we don't stop to admire what we've accomplished, rather we press on to what lies ahead. What a great quote. And I wanted to ask you a question this morning because there's a question I've been considering and reflecting on and the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about it. <laughs> Do you have the posture of a disciple? Are you eager to learn? Are you willing to listen? Are you ready to obey? Even when you're out of your comfort zone and even when it costs you something. Do you still have the posture of a disciple. Maybe you once did, but do you still have that posture? 
because you never graduate. Discipline is not something we should dread. Discipline and discipleship are a package deal. And discipline is about acquiring skills of faith. Discipline means choosing to delay instant gratification now for a much higher good later on. In Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul uses three pictures to describe aspects of this life of faith. Faith, leaning fully on Jesus, putting all the weight of our trust on him and his promises. He uses the picture of a soldier, an athlete and a farmer. So I want to ask us some reflection questions around this passage of Scripture. I'm going to read it first and then we're going to talk about some questions. And I want you to think about some of these things and what God might be saying to you. Here's the Scripture. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable people who will be also sorry who also be qualified to teach others join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs but rather tries to please his commanding officer similarly anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules the hard working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops Reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. The first verse, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Are you strong in the grace of God? Do you need to go deeper in the word or go back to the foundation of the Christian faith and understand this gospel of grace and how it applies to every aspect of your life. How are you going to set aside time for this? What, what are you going to cut out of your life or, or so that you can actually spend the time you need to really become grounded, immovable, understanding and personally applying and receiving the grace of God? Not just the grace of God that saved you, but the grace of God that sustains you every single day of your life. The grace of God that you need to draw upon to live out this life that Jesus has called us to live? Do you need to renew your mind? Do you need to let God transform you by changing the way you think? Do you struggle with fear, with worry, with guilt, with anger? I mean, I could go on and on. Find something, if there's something that you struggle with, do a word study on it. Pull out all the scriptures and say, all right, God, show me what it is. Give you some keys on how I can grow more like you in this area. What do you look at? What do you intake via the media? Do you need to renew your mind and stop or start something? Who could help you? Who could walk alongside you and encourage you with that? Do you need to get around environments of faith more regularly? Because you can't be strong in the grace of God if you're trying to be a solo Christian. That's actually not... The Bible teaches we need community. (laughs) We need to be strong in the grace of God. And there's times where... Our faith is like, and we need the community of believers. We're like, yeah, remember that story, and I've heard that, and man, they're holding on, and they're going to pray for me, and they're going to stand alongside me, they're going to encourage me, they're cheering me on. They're reminding me that I'm not a complete failure. They're saying, no, 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 no. Jesus loves you. You can do this. <laughs> we need community. We can't be solo Christians. And for some of you, this is a word for you today. You need to make some commitments in your heart to say, I'm going to regularly put myself in environments of faith so I become strong in the grace of God. I'm going to make connect group or Sunday services like, I'm coming every week. I'm just like putting that in first. Because without it, I know what happens. I become weak 
in the grace of God and understanding it. And I, I start to doubt God and I start to feel like I'm really bad. And The second verse talks about entrusting things to reliable people. Are you seasoned in the faith? Is there someone one step behind you who you could deposit into? Or are you just focused on yourself and your own life circumstances? Who could you build into? And you can be intentional about this. You can invest into someone's life. You can look for areas of trustworthiness in their life and and say, good on you, encourage that, fan it into flames. The third verse talks about suffering. Paul says, join me in suffering. We don't like it when Paul talks like that because we think suffering. We want to run away from suffering. (laughs) It's not very nice. And I'm conscious that there's some of you here who are going through a time of suffering. Don't draw back or be thrown off course when suffering happens. It can be painful very painful and it's not always need, easy to know how God is at work but somehow some way somehow God is working for your good and actually I don't know how he does it but he uses it to deepen our trust in him to train us to be more like Jesus Who do you need to tell or open up to or seek help from? Because you don't need to walk alone when you're going through suffering. You have a church family here who can walk with you. Verse 4 talks about a good soldier. A good soldier. You are engaged in a spiritual battle whether you know it or not. Are you still loyally devoted to Jesus above all else? Are you entangled in everyday life to the point where you've lost sight of the eternal? What needs to change? In light of his ultimate sacrifice for you, would you, a soldier is prepared to lay down their life, would you lay down your comfort, your security, even your life if he asked you? Verse 5 talks about an athlete. Are you stewarding well what God has entrusted to you? An athlete's been given gifts, natural gifts and abilities. You've been given things in your life, relationships, time, gifts and abilities. Where do you need to align with or come under the authority of God's word in your life? Maybe you are in debt and you've never ever thought about the whole area of tithing or even doing a budget or things like that. There's things that the Word of God has to say about that. Maybe the way you use your words, God wants to work a change in, in your life, how you use your words. Maybe it's health and resting well and Exercise. God's been speaking to me about those things. And a farmer, verse 6. Are you patiently and faithfully about the father's business? A farmer's dependent on the weather. He's dependent on sowing at the right time to sow and reaping at the right time to reap. And Are you actively participating in God's rescue mission to draw lost people to himself? Are you working in his field and sowing seeds, anticipating his harvest work in the people's lives that he's planted you in? Some very sobering questions. (laughs) But you know, some of you might have said nope to one thing. Some of you might have said nope to many things. Some of you might have said nope to all of that. (laughs) And... 
If I just finished there, that would leave us all feeling like, yeah, well, we're really not that crash hot, are we? We've got a long way to go in this apprenticeship thing. (laughs) But there's good news. Because like me, you can probably relate to the Apostle Paul when he says in Romans 7, I don't understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. Do you ever feel like that? I feel like that all the time. And Paul wrote this. Paul, like the super Christian Paul. Some commentators think he wrote it before it was was talking about when he was before he got saved. No, 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 no. He was so acutely aware of where he didn't measure up in his apprenticeship. That's Paul saying that. And so we all have them. Areas that where we think, you know what, I'm not as disciplined as I want to be right at this moment. I'm not looking much like Jesus. In fact, I'm looking the opposite of Jesus. It's downright ugly. <laughs> I remember um, an area that God has really been working on me over many years, building discipline into is to seek reconciliation and to forgive and to make restitution in relationships and do that quickly as a Christian, as a follower of him. And I remember one time um, having a bit of an argument with my husband. You never have fights with your husbands or wives, do you? Wow. You guys are really good apprentices. (laughs) I don't believe you. (laughs) And I remember going and I was so cross and I remember God saying, just whispering into my spirit, do you want to be right or do you want to have a good marriage? And I'm like, "Um," because I was like, "Mm, I'm right and he's not right and he should be apologising first. And and God was challenging me, no, you need to make the first move. You need to make things right. Love you, honey. You might be here and for the first time ever, for the first time in a long time, you are thinking about God and wondering what he thinks about your life up until this point. And you know deep in your heart that there are some things that are just not right. No one else knows but God knows. But the fact that you are here is evident that the Holy Spirit is working on your heart and life and he's wanting to draw you to himself. He's wanting to reveal God's great love for you and the fact that you don't have to live this life on your own, that you actually can come under his leadership and guidance for your life. You can receive his forgiveness. You can let him take the wheel. You don't have to try and behave, you manage yourself and fit yourself and squeeze yourself into this perfect little and then bust out. <laughs> believers. Rick Warren says, even after you become a believer, there's this tension inside of you. You have, a, you have your good nature that God gave you, but you also have your old sinful nature that is pulling at you, pulling at you. Galatians talks about this. In Galatians 5, it says, verse 17, the old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just the opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly finding each other and your choices are never free from this conflict. And do you know, because our choices are never free from this conflict, this tension within us, am I going to go my way or God's way, my way or God's way? We can believe this lie that we are stuck that we're never going to be able to change, that we're never going to be able to get better, that we're going to struggle with a certain area for the rest of our life and start to believe that it's who we are, it's who we've become. And that is just rubbish. It becomes this cycle of frustration and striving, frustration and striving, frustration and striving. And that's what Paul was talking about. He goes on in Romans 7, he says, It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law, God's way, with all my heart. But there is another law, my way, (laughs) 
that is at work within me, that is at war with my mind. This law wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? This is Paul, super Paul talking. Man, if he struggled with this, we struggle with this big time. And while we're vulnerable, while we're already feeling frustrated at ourselves because we know what we want to do and we fail to follow through with it again and again and again, the accuser, the devil comes along and whispers to us, you call yourself a Christian? Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are? You can't even control yourself in fill in the blank. God's angry with you, you know. God could never forgive that. And you think God could use you. What a joke. You're too messed up for God to use. Some of you have heard stuff like that this week. But thank goodness that Paul was training as an apprentice and he knew what to do with those lies. <laughs> he knew where to look. And so in Romans 7, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? But then he says, Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul had learned where to look. He had learned to look away from his inability, away from his inadequacy, away from his unableness to fulfill what God wanted him to do. And he learned to look to Jesus' adequacy, to Jesus' perfect way of fulfilling, to Jesus who had the ability to do something through him. You know why? Because after Jesus cried on the, died on the cross, all the sin stuff that separated us from him, he dealt with it. He was buried, he was risen from the dead. He's alive and he's here this morning. And do you know that he rose to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father and he sent the Holy Spirit because he knew this life that he's calling us to, this discipleship, apprenticeship life, we cannot do without the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it on our own. And when we try and we try and we try, we end up in this cycle of frustration. The powerful presence of Jesus' life-giving spirit was now operating within Paul. And he knew that. He'd learned, even when he didn't feel that, that that was the truth. And so he goes on to say in Romans 8.1, just after that little bit, so now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Some of you came to church just to hear that this morning. God doesn't condemn you. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. For the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses could not save us because of our sinful nature. It could show us all the things that we weren't doing right, but it couldn't actually save us. But God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own son in a human body like ours, except that ours are sinful. God destroyed sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Can you say hallelujah to that? Well, that was really exciting. Come on, guys, that's awesome. And the significance of God destroying sin's control is that we don't have to say yes to all the things that sin urges us to do. We can go talk to the hand, no, I'm not going to do that. Before Jesus came, we didn't have the power to say no, actually. We just, okay, I don't want to do that. And then we just follow it. Now, with this new power in operation in us, we actually have the power to say no. I am not going to do that. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. We can say no to our own selfishness and yes to what God wants and then say, Holy Spirit, help me. (laughs) Instead of redoubling our efforts to behaviour, manage ourselves and squeeze ourselves and fall far short of it time and time again and over and over again, we can look away from ourselves and look to Jesus. We can ask for his help and then step out by faith to do what he asks us to do, but remembering that he's going to empower us. It's not by our self effort. It's not by self-improvement. 
but in the new way of the Spirit. Trusting Him to help us every step of the way. Some of you have bought into the lie that you're stuck. It's a lie. You are not stuck. You are not defeated. You are not beyond help. You do not have to settle for always struggling in this area. Can I hear an amen for that? Come on, let's stir our faith. Romans 7, it says, Now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, you can. Turn to the person next to you and say, I can. Say it like you mean it. Turn to the person next to you and say, I can. One more time. Come on. Some of you are really unconvincing. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, I can. That's right. You're united with Jesus. As a result, you can produce good fruit, Romans 7 says. That is good deeds for God. Now we can really serve God, not in the old way by obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way by the Spirit. You need to learn a new language. So do I. Yes, I can. (laughs) Yes, I can. I can grow. I can learn. I can cooperate with the Holy Spirit. I can let him pick me up when I fall down because I belong to Jesus. And do you know, Pastor Sam shared that verse. There is now no condemnation. He didn't know I was going to talk about that. Lift up your eyes, your spiritual eyes. Look to Jesus. Do you know, you are absolutely powerless to change yourself. You are absolutely powerless to change yourself. Lasting change, heart change, authentic change. Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire to obey and the power to do what pleases him. The desire and the power. Do you know, even the fact that you want to do the right thing is God working in your life. He even works on your desires. That's pretty awesome. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You can say, talk to the hand. I'm looking to Jesus. I might not be very good at this now, but I'm going to keep looking to him every time I fall, every time I trip over, and he's going to help me. That is such good news, guys. That's amazing. I want us to think about some application as we pray now and actually admit our reliance upon God. Admit that in that area where we're struggling, we are actually powerless to help ourselves. We actually need desperately the help of our God and he's willing to give it. So shall we do that? Shall we pray?